great crowd that had gathered heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The crowd praised him, celebrated his miracles, and with great expectation told everyone about him. But they did not know him. They were waiting for someone who would rule with strength and might, but he came as a humble servant. They were expecting a general who would crush their enemies, but he came saying, love your enemies. They wanted him to finally bring their people glory, but he wanted to change them so their lives would bring God glory. They would soon realize that Jesus wasn't going to be what they wanted, and they turned on him before they ever realized he was what they needed. And as they yelled, crucify, Pilate asked Jesus, are you a king? Jesus answered, I am not that kind of king. His kingdom isn't what you see here. It won't be established by chaos and war. His kingdom is in our hearts. His kingdom is righteousness, forgiveness, and love. Today, we lift our voices. We cry, Hosanna, Lord, save us. Come dwell in our hearts, Jesus Christ, our King. Let's join in praise to our King. Will you please stand and let's sing together.
praise the name of the Lord, our God. We come to you, we gather together to worship you, to sing praise to your name. On this Palm Sunday, we begin Holy Week. We are once again reminded of you sending your son into this world to suffer and to die on the cross to bear our sins. And on the third day again, he arose, conquering death and giving us all eternal and everlasting life. We praise you, dear Lord. We honor and we glorify you. We proclaim to the nations, to the world, behold, our God, there is none like you.
So kids, in just a minute, you're going to go with Miss Carly for Kids Rock. Um, when you come back, we're going to sing a song that says, oh, praise his name. Praise the name of Jesus forevermore. And if you would like to, we would love for you to grab one of these palm branches. Did you see them on the front here? Could you grab one when you come back in and wave it to remind us of those people who are welcoming Jesus as a king that they didn't quite understand, but we do now, right? So when you come back from Kids Rock, if you're willing to wave one, that would be awesome. And you can take it home with you. And if anyone else wants a reminder and bring a palm branch home, um, 20 of you or so are welcome to do that as well. So feel free to grab one. Um, and kids, next week, we are so excited that you have some special things to share with us on Easter, right? Reminding us of who Jesus is and reminding us to behold him and to think about the amazing things he's done for us. So we are so looking forward to that, too. All right, kids, you and Miss Carly and your other helpers can head on out. Good morning. It's kind of good to see um, a few people that I know have been on vacation this week, and um, you made it back safely. I'm glad to see that. Good to see Cheryl here this morning as well. And um, we didn't mention this, but um, Levi Scott this week was with a group of students from Ileana Christian High School serving in West Virginia, I believe. And um, so I just want to recognize that. Um, a great opportunity, I think, for young people to serve um, actually for anybody of any age to serve. So um, I just want to recognize that. A couple announcements I want to make, share with you. One is that this Friday, Good Friday, is what we call it, um, which I always thought was kind of interesting when I was growing up because we celebrate the fact that Jesus was crucified and that doesn't necessarily seem like good but we'll talk about that on that day. And that is going to be a 7 o'clock service jointly with Kingdom Ministries. And we've also talked to a couple other churches in town here and in the area that we have invited them to come be part of that as well. Um, then next Sunday is Easter Sunday, or if you're more familiar with this terminology, Resurrection Sunday. It's the day that we celebrate that Friday was dark, but Sunday was coming. And um, I also want to let you know that on April 30th, there's going to be a, um, a prayer event, and it's going to be at Shepherd's Community Church in Harvey, and um, that's a couple blocks from Thornton High School, and you'll hear more about that, but it's from 5 to 7, is that right, Justin? And um, it's going to be a prayer event with hopefully tons of um, churches participating, and I hope that we will have a group, a large group of uh, Thorn Creekers there. In fact, Honestly, what I'm praying is that, that that's not a very big church. I'm hoping that by Sunday, April 30th, we start to feel like we won't fit in there. So anyway, if you want to know more about that, talk to Justin Rogers. Um, a couple other prayer things I want you to know about. One is that Renee Dykstra um, had surgery this week, and there was kind of a complication well, where they nicked a nerve, I think, and she's going to be fine. I, was, uh, I went and saw her this week, um, but she's go going through some prayer, uh, some breathing rehab, and uh, just be praying for her. Um, and also, um, John and Barb Scott, and there's a whole story here, but 
John and Barb both fell this week, and um, I think they're both going to be fine, but John broke his nose and, his, and a bone in his hand, and Barb broke her femur, so um, just be praying for them as... Um, same day, right, Rick? Is that right? Yeah, so it was a bad day to be a Scott. Mark, how you feeling? You are all right? Okay. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you so much. We thank you so much for who you are. We worship you. And Lord, as we just sang, we want to behold you. We want to behold you, not with our eyes, because we know at this point, we could not even handle that. But Lord, we want to behold you with our hearts and our minds. We want to know you better. We want to be in your presence. And even as I pray that, Lord, we know that we are in your presence. And Lord, we confess that there have been times in our lives that we went through the motions and we forgot that the God of the universe, the creator of all things, the one who sustains and hold everything in his hands, that you are with us when we worship, but you're also with us every moment of every day. Lord, we pray that we would live our lives beholding you. And Lord, we pray beyond that, that the world around us would see you in us. We pray that we would be so incredibly transformed by our knowledge about you and our knowledge of you that the world would see clearly, that they would have no trouble seeing the power and majesty and glory and grace and holiness of God by what they see in our lives. And Lord, we know that we can't do that on our own, no matter how hard we try. So, Lord, we pray that you would pour out your spirit moment to moment, day to day in our lives, and that we would be transformed by what you are doing, by what you have done, and what you continue to do in your people. Lord, we want to pray for the, for the world around us. We want to pray for our neighborhoods. We want to pray for our schools, for our workplaces. We want to pray for our families, Lord. There are those in this room who have family members that we love dearly, who have walked away from you, who have decided that they don't want to follow this Jesus. And Lord, we pray that we would be faithful in demonstrating for them um, what it means to walk with you, and Lord, even more than that, we pray that you would pour out your spirit and draw them to yourself. Lord, we want to pray for those who might be watching this service online. Lord, we just pray that they would know your spirit, that they would know the fellowship of the people of God, even from a distance. And Lord, we pray for our communities. We pray for the south suburbs in northwest Indiana. Lord, we pray that this would be a place, a part of your world that is known for knowing you. And Lord, we pray for the brokenness and pain in our society, for the violence that we see around us. Lord, we hear stories about children being killed in schools. And we hear stories about um, tornadoes and violence and war and hunger and famine and hatred. And Lord, we are reminded that we need Lord, we pray for this world. We pray for those in leadership that you would guide them. We pray that you would shape their hearts. And Lord, we pray that we would be faithful in praying for those in leadership. Lord, we need you, and we are here to hear from you 
this morning, right now, in Jesus' name, amen. So, um, I want to read to you from Mark chapter 11. I'm going to read the first 18 verses. Then after I read this as a kind of a, as a story, we're going to go back and walk through it. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, what, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at the doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming king of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything. But since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. On reaching Jerusalem, jo Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him, because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. Let's pray. Lord, write your word in our heart. We pray that you would speak to our hearts and our minds. And Lord, we pray that my words would be your words. And that all of our hearts and minds would hear from you. In the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So here's the situation. Up until this point, Jesus has been traveling around doing his ministry, it's involved teaching, it's involved healing, he's been teaching crowds of people, he's also been teaching a lot with just his disciples. Really, that's the focus of his ministry up to this point, is he's saying, these 12 men that I've chosen, I'm going to pour into them, and he explains this to them, and it's interesting because three times in the chapters leading up to this, he says, basically, hey, guys, I'm going to be killed, and I'm going to rise again. Now, in Mark 8, he says that, and Peter rebukes him, which is always an interesting thing to rebuke the Son of God. So, 
It's not getting through to them. So in the next chapter, in Mark chapter 9, Jesus says again, I'm going to be killed and I'm going to rise again. And then Mark writes for us and he says, um, they, didn't, they, they got together and they discussed, I wonder what he means. He said, I'm going to die, I'm going to be killed, I'm going to rise again after three days. And they're like, what does he mean? Parents, you ever felt that way talking to your kids? You know, clean your room. I wonder what she means by that. It's obvious. He's saying, I'm going to be killed. I'm going to rise again. And then in Mark chapter 10, he says this in verse 33. He says, we are going up to Jerusalem. It's almost like you almost can hear Jesus saying, read my lips. We're going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man, that's me, guys, will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, we will, he will rise. I mean, he's being really, really clear. So then what happens after that, after he's made it very clear, James and John come up to him and say, hey, Jesus, would you do us a favor? He's basically saying, will you do what we ask? And Jesus said, well, what do you want? He says, well, we want to be on your right and left hand in glory. And Jesus basically responds, do you know what you're asking? I mean, it, it's going to be hard. And in verse 45 of chapter 10, he says, Even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Again, no matter how many times Jesus says it, they don't understand. And it's easy to kind of look at them and say, they're just so slow. We are so much better at understanding Jesus, right? Maybe not. Because I think there are a lot of times that we hear what Jesus says, that we read the Bible, and we hear this stuff, and we say, well, that's what he meant, but what he, that's what he said, but what he really meant was, I mean, that's why there are literally hundreds of millions of people in churches in the world who are listening to and embracing a prosperity gospel that says, hey, if I follow Jesus, everything will be great. And if I have enough faith, God will give me lots and lots of money and health and everything will be wonderful. And I, I read through the Bible and there's like three verses they pull out that kind of suggest that-ish. And meanwhile, there's all of these passages in the Bible that say things like, yeah, don't be surprised if you're persecuted, beaten. Life will be hard. It'll be difficult to follow Jesus. And in fact, if you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to take up your cross and follow him. So maybe we don't understand Jesus very well either. So let's dig into this passage. As they approached Jerusalem, came to Bethphage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, basically it's a couple suburbs, couple small communities outside of it. He sends his disciples ahead and says, right when you go into the village, there's going to be a colt there, and um, untie it and bring it. And we don't really know whether, um, you know, whether he's arranged for a ride or whether he's just saying sovereignly, as the Son of God, he's saying, um, you know, I'm just going to make this work. But in the eyes of the disciples, he very well might have been basically saying, go steal a donkey. 
You know, you're going to go to this town, and there's going to be a car parked there. Just get in the car and drive it out here. We don't really know for sure, but it's kind of an odd thing. But the most confusing thing is the nature of the Uber that Jesus is getting here. He says, there's going to be a pony, a colt. That word could mean a little colt. It could mean a little horse. It could mean a little donkey. We don't really know. But the emphasis, the clear thing, is that it's not a, a big, powerful war horse. And that's an important thing for us to understand because for any of the Jewish people in that day, they would have immediately thought back to Zechariah chapter 9 where... Um, um, Basically, we are told, behold the king who comes riding on a donkey. And, um, you know, if you go to the gospel, um, if you go to the Matthew story, by the way, this is one of those passages, one of those events in the Bible that I, I think it's useful to say, okay, I'm going to look and see what Matthew says about this, what Mark says about it, what Luke says about it, what John says about it. Not that they contradict, they just bring out different details that are valuable. And in fact, in Matthew 21, 5, Matthew says, okay, this is what Zechariah was talking about when he says, say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. In other words, he's saying, this is me. I'm the king that it's talking about. And that's kind of confusing, because actually that passage in the Old Testament, a lot of Jewish scholars were already kind of confused about, because they're, wait a minute, this is our king. He's not going to ride on a little humble donkey. I mean, this is the kind of ride that a hobbit would have taken. You know, if you're a Lord of the Rings person, this is Bill the horse, you know. And it doesn't make sense. I mean, somehow we see clearly here that there's this contrast in Jesus. He is king. He is majestic. He is powerful. He is coming as a king, but he's also coming meekly. We see power and weakness. We see majesty and meekness. Now, I think it's valuable for us to stop and ask ourselves if there's a contrast there between the majesty and power of Jesus and the humility and gentleness of Jesus. Most psychologists, Christian or not, would say, you know, we're individually drawn to one or the other of those, right? Like some of us, we, we're the kind of people that when we think about the majesty and power of Jesus, we're drawn to that. We're like, yes, that's my God, that's my King. But others of us, oh man, this beautiful picture of a gentle, meek Savior who, you know, reaches out and touches lepers. I, I think it's valuable for us to not focus on the one that we're drawn to, but sometimes we need to focus on the other one. Anyway, um, this is what Zechariah says, because um, it's interesting, whenever the Bible refers to a passage in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, I think it's valuable to go back and see what it says. And this is what Zechariah says. 9 verse 9 says, oh, you know, your king is going to come riding on a colt. But then it goes on. Zechariah writes, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, and the war horse from Jerusalem. And the battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace to the nations. 
His rule shall be from sea to sea, from the rivers to the ends of the earth. Now, notice what he says there. And this is why people were confused. He's saying, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem. He's saying, it's not going to be about war. It's not going to be about victory. It's not going to be about power. In fact, he says, the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace to the nations. Now, the, the Israelite people thought that when the Messiah came, he was going to really go in there and just kick some tail. He was going to come in and bring victory and take away these Romans. And this says he shall speak peace to the nations. People then thought that somehow the, the solution to our problems was military victory. It was power. And sometimes we still think that. I, I wonder why Jesus didn't think that. Going on at verse 7 of Mark 11. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the field. They, those who went ahead shout, and those who followed shouted, Hosanna. Now, I keep looking in here for the verse where it says, and the children shouted. I mean, I grew up singing, and I've told you this before, and I'll keep saying this, every Palm Sunday I ever stand in this pulpit, I will remind us that, you know, I grew up singing, Hosanna, loud Hosanna, the little... Must be in the Greek. No. Th that's why the words of the songs we sing matter. Now, I don't think it harms anything when we say that. But it's not what the Bible says. In fact, it, may, it says all the people. And I, I, I keep asking myself, why do we want to say that? And I think it's because a lot of us as adults, as I get older, the ground is farther and farther away. Has anybody else noticed that? We like to be dignified in adults. And Jesus says we need to be like a child. Just saying. Now, Luke, in his version of this story, tells us that the Pharisees wanted Jesus to rebuke the crowd. They actually go to him and say, Rabbi, you need, you need to tell them to calm down. Take it easy. This crowd is out of control. And we don't really know exactly why they're saying that in this situation, but there's really two possibilities. One possibility is they're saying, well, this crowd is just crazy. They're out of hand. They're, they're yelling and screaming. And it's kind of scary if you've ever been around a protest or a, a loud kind of thing. I, I always intended in the 90s to go down to one of the Bulls' um, victory celebrations. But I also know that there's something about a crowd like that that's crazy. It's a little scary. So maybe they're upset because well, the crowd's un uninhibited. But, and there is part of us that wants it to be, well, you know, we're in the Reformed tradition where we say, well, we want everything to be done decently and in good order, which is 1 Corinthians 14. But if you read 1 Corinthians 14, here's what it says. It says, well, okay, when you gather to worship, uh, 
I, I need you to understand that only two or at the most three people should speak in tongues and only one at a time. Now, that's not the definition of decently and in good order that I have experienced in my life. And, and, and it goes on, and Paul writes, oh, and there should be one speaker who's, you know, who's speaking for God, who's bringing God's word, but if somebody else gets a revelation from God, they should just stand up and start talking, and the first speaker should sit down and be quiet. Now, that's obviously crazy talk. We should, no, I... Our understanding of what it means to worship, honestly, is far more restrained and quiet and, yeah. They're bringing the ark back into Jerusalem and David is dancing and he's uninhibited. And his wife yells at him, and he says, Hey, you think this is crazy? I'm going to be even more undignified. Which is exactly what every wife wants her husband to say when she says, Calm down, honey. So maybe they're partly upset because the crowd is excited. Or maybe they're upset because of what the crowd was yelling. They're yelling, save! Which is a way that they would yell, you know, you're the Messiah, blessed is you who comes in the name of the Lord, save! They're worshiping Jesus. And, you know, you're not supposed to worship anybody but God. But what you've got is chaos. Well, and the one thing that is clear is that they are worshiping the king. And I want us to watch just a short video here. I love this. This is the same preacher that preached, you might have heard this before, the it's Friday but Sunday's coming sermon. This is the same guy, he was a pastor in Philadelphia. Let's watch this just quick. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's a king of Israel. He's a king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he purifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a well-framed of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway 
Jesus they were worshiping. No wonder they were shouting. Because that's the king. That's King Jesus. So it's chaos. It's crowd. It's yelling. Jesus entered Jerusalem, going on to verse 11, and went into the temple courts. He looks around, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany. He looks around, goes into the um, temple, and then it says the next morning, we're going to skip verses 12 through 14 now. We'll come back there in a second. But he walks into the temple. Now, in order to understand what's happening next, you need to see the temple. Okay, this is kind of a, this is not an actual photo of the first century temple, but um, this is what it looked like. And in order to get some sense of scale, that the, the front uh, wall there is basically more than five football fields long, okay? Each of those yards on the side is the size of several football fields. I mean, it's huge. And it says that he comes in, and that was called the Court of the Gentiles. The Court of the Gentiles was on the two sides. That was a huge area. And what it says is Jesus entered them and began to drive out those who were buying and selling. See, what was going on was that there were literally, Jesus would have walked in and seen literally thousands of people, hundreds of booths selling everything, selling, you know, sheep and selling pigeons and selling, selling lambs, selling things to be sacrificed. In fact, um, historian Josephus, who was not a Christian, but he wrote about this, said at one point there was a Passover week where they had sold 255,000 animals in a week. I mean, this is chaos. It's like the trading floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange mixed with the tri-state um, exchange thing over there in Palos. I mean, it's crazy. Now, that was the court of the Gentiles. This is supposed to be the place where the people not from Israel could come and could pray. And that was going to be the place where they could come and worship the God of Israel. And see, that area had been taken over to meet the worship needs and desires and practices of the people of Israel. They had said, oh, this area that's supposed to be focused on the world and, and reaching the nations is going to be just used for us. So we have a place to buy stuff. And Jesus says, this is not the way it's going to be. God was about 
his people reaching the world. And so, you know, when Jesus comes into this and he sees what's going on, most scholars that study this say he's probably not primarily focused on just the buying and selling. He's also saying it's supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations. Now, he does say you've made it a den of robbers. But what he's doing is he's saying the sacrifices are not the point. It's not the point. In fact, in Zechariah 14, the continuation of the passage we looked at a moment ago, it says that when the Messiah comes, two things will happen. Number one, the nations will be invited in, which really bothers the Israelites because they're like, no, he's our God. The nations will be invited in. And then in Zechariah 14, and I would encourage you, go back and read this and kind of look at it. In Zechariah 14, 21, it says this, when the king fully comes, every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holy to the Lord of hosts, so that all who sacrifice may come and take of them and boil the meat of the sacrifice in them. Every pot shall be holy. Let's let's look at the temple again. Um, In the temple, in that white building, inside there, there was that cube area. We talked about it last week. The Holy of Holies. And that was the place where people could come into the very presence of God. And by the altar, there were a couple pots there which would be used for sacrifices and blood and and all kinds of things. And Jesus is saying, when Zechariah is, is saying from God, when the Messiah comes, it's not just going to be those pots that are holy. Every pot's going to be holy. In, in fact, what he's saying is the whole world will be the holy of holies. There will come a day when the whole world will be sanctified when, as we talked about last week, when we will be back in paradise, we'll talk about next week the fact that when Jesus dies, the veil is torn because no longer do we have to kind of whisper from God from a distance. Zechariah goes on and says, there shall no longer be a traitor, traitor as in one who trades, not a traitor, a traitor in the house of the Lord of hosts on that day. The sacrificial system is going to be gone. Now, before we take communion here, I want us to rewind to verse 12. Because there's an odd story. As Jesus, in, in verse 12, is leaving Bethany, going to Jerusalem, he's hungry. And he sees a fig tree in leaf. And honestly, there's a story that on the surface, first reading, makes Jesus look bad. Because basically what it says is, there was a leafy tree, and Jesus went up to it, looking for something to eat, and it says, it tells us, this is not fig season, okay? Okay? And there's no figs. And basically what it seems like Jesus is doing is he throws a little temper tantrum. He sounds like a spoiled child, doesn't he? Fine, if I can't have it, nobody can have it. But here's what's going on here. The kind of fig tree that grew and still grows in that area really bears fruit in two different ways. There's the full-blown figs, but then there's also a time when a fig tree was just starting to leaf. And there were these little nubs that are not enough to really get get much, 
but it's just a little bit of something. It was sweet. And in fact, the travelers were in the habit, travelers would stop, and there weren't figs, but there was little fruit, these little nubs. And Jesus goes to this tree, and it's not fig season, but he says, there's leaves, but there's no fruit. And what we know about these trees is that when that happens, the tree looks good. There's leaves. It looks like everything's fine, but there's no fruit. And in fact, anybody that raises these figs will know that, okay, that tree is diseased. Jesus isn't as much saying, stupid tree. He's saying, this tree looks good, but it's not right. And what Jesus is doing here, and what Mark is telling us this story about, is he's saying, you know, you, you have crowds of people, and they look good. The crowd, as Jesus is walking into Jerusalem, they're yelling and shouting and celebrating, and it looks like they've got, they've got it all together. But within a few days, that same crowd is yelling, crucify him, crucify him. And Jesus is saying, just because there's external stuff that looks really good, that doesn't mean that everything is right. Now, because we live in a production-oriented society, we tend to think that fruit is about activity. It's about numbers. It's about programs. It's about converts. It's about, you know, if we say, oh, that church has borne a lot of fruit, I, I think our minds tend to say, oh, a lot of people are coming to Christ. And that's a good thing. But when the Bible talks about us bearing fruit, it's almost always internal. Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, character. You look at John 15, when Jesus says, apart from me, you know, if you abide in me, you can bear fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. He's talking about, you're going to have hard times, and you're going to struggle. But if you dwell in Christ, there will be a change in your character. That's the main fruit. So Jesus is saying, look, I'm not primarily concerned about what you look like on the outside. I want to know what's happening in your heart. That's the fruit. And by the way, if you've ever raised anything in your life, you know that ultimately the fruit of a tree is a result of what's going on inside. Verse 18 is where we end. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him. For they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. So where do we kind of land this plane as we prepare to come to the table? I want to ask you three questions. Number one, what's holding you back from worship? We have this picture of people that are pouring themselves out. And I'm not s talking about whether or not you raise your hands or whether or not you, you know, wave. And, but what's stopping you from fully worshiping God? Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's embarrassment. 
maybe you feel like if I really worship God with my whole life, it'll cost me something. But what's holding you back from worship? Second question I want to ask you is this. Do you ever find yourself opposed to what Jesus is doing? We have these Pharisees who look, look at Jesus and listen to Jesus, and they heard this and began looking for a way to kill him. Now, our first thought is, well, I would never do that. Are there times that God does things and we're like, oh, that makes me nervous. I'm not sure that fits in my box. When we talk, I haven't mentioned this in a while, but when we talk about um, our situation as a church, we are a primarily white Caucasian church in a community that's primarily African American. And we are in a society that says it doesn't work. White people and black people and, and other colors of people, they can't get along. Jesus says, that's not true. And part of what I say without hesitation, God is calling Thorn Creek to be, is a church that people can look at and we're not like, oh, we're just trying to reach people who are black or people who are Hispanic or who are Asian or white. We want to be a church, God has called us to be a church that says, it doesn't matter because when Christ, we are all one. And honestly, that's a little uncomfortable sometimes for people in all categories. But it's what God has called us to, and it's what we need to find a way to be. Or are we opposed to what Jesus? And finally, you notice why they were upset? Because the whole crowd was amazed. When was the last time you were amazed by Jesus? We're going to take communion here. And it's great that the kids are coming in right now because... This is a great object lesson of what the gospel is. That this same wonderful, kingly, humble Jesus came to Jerusalem to die. And so we come in remembrance that the Lord Jesus was sent into the world to live a perfect life but to die and to rise again. We come to remember that. We come to have communion with this same Christ and with each other. And we come in hope because there is a promise that we will for partake of a feast when the kingdom has fully come. When with unveiled face we shall behold him and be made like him in his glory. Let's pray. Lord, we are here to worship you. You are our king. You are our savior. You are our hope. You are our life. You are the truth. You are our only hope. Lord, speak to us as we come to your table.
The Lord Jesus, the same night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. Saying, this is my body, broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup and said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Jesus wasn't just initiating a ritual, creating a tradition. He was saying, I want you, I think, not only when we have this formal event, but every time you eat and drink, especially when you eat and drink together, remember what Jesus did. I want to invite the elders forward. Um, just to be clear, um, if you have made a profession of your faith in a Bible-believing church, and you have received Christ as your king, you are welcome at the table. We are going to um, pass both the bread and the cup. And so as these come, um, we ask you to take one of each. And then you, if you would hold them, and we will all partake together, first of the bread and then of the wine.
the bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ. The cup of blessing which we bless is the communion of the blood of Christ shed for you. Lord, feed our souls. Feed our hearts, feed our minds. Make us like you. And Lord, we pray that we would be set free to worship the king who died to set us free. In Jesus' name. We are going to sing a closing song, and um, I do want to remind you that there is a congregational meeting that will start about 15 minutes after this service is done, um, and we will be um, meeting with the classes to talk about our denomination, but I hate to say that right as we come out of communion. Remember that it's all ultimately about Jesus. And we're going to praise his name. This song will kind of launch us towards this week as we turn our minds to Calvary.
this place may every breath shout Hosanna may every act reflect the Savior and may every moment be a moment of celebration and hope because Jesus is the King and He's alive Amen